so my name is Sean McDyer, uh, along with my wife, who's down manning the booth down in the hall right now. We own and operate Sunhands Farm. Uh, we are in Kalispell, uh, but uh, as I was just saying a few minutes ago, we are about the far west edge of the 59901. Uh, we are about a mile east of Kyla on Highway 2 in the Smith Valley. Uh, we have six acres out there that we do diversified vegetables. Uh, we grow all kinds of gourmet mushrooms, including oysters, like you see there, we do King Strafaria occasionally, um, we do shiitake, um, we do lion's mane, and we'll be doing chestnut, and a few other experimental ones this year as we're expanding our facility. Um, I kind of struggled with what to call this presentation because there's so much involved in the subject of mushrooms and fungi. I mean, it, it involves everything in, in the entire world natural world. It's, it's so diverse and we know so little about it. So I'm calling it Mushrooms for Health and Nutrition. And when I say health, that's kind of a broad spectrum term, meaning environmental health and ecosystem health and not just human health. But we will talk a lot about nutrition and dietary um, nutrition of mushrooms. So what are mushrooms? So how many people here actually eat mushrooms on a regular basis? How many of you eat mushrooms that are other than white button, cremini, or portobello? Okay, so about half of that. And how many of you guys forage for mushrooms occasionally? You feel safe identifying wild mushrooms. Okay, that's pretty good. There's a, there's a strange mysticism about mushrooms where a lot of people just feel like it's such an unknown and scary topic that I've heard people say that, oh, don't touch that mushroom. You could you know, get sick and die. There's no mushroom in the entire world that you can actually get sick, violently ill from just touching you and being to ingest it. And it's part of the, they call mycophobia, the fear of mushrooms because they're so diverse and so unknown that people just, rather than getting to know them, they just have this unused fear of them that keeps them from exploring more mushrooms. And there's so many more available that go beyond the white mushroom, white button mushrooms that you buy in grocery stores that are, are way better in my opinion. Right? So we'll go through and identify these as well. Uh, does anybody know the top left there? That's, yeah. So that's commonly available here in the Western State Forest. What was it? I didn't know. That. Chanterelle. Okay. Uh, and they're always yellow like that. They have uh, gills that run from the stem up. That's how you identify them against some of their uh, actually poisonous uh, lookalikes. Uh, top right here, this is one that's. Puffball? Yeah, giant puffball. So this is one that was actually growing in our arugula fields. Uh, they grow on basically decomposing organic matter, so grassy materials. You see them in a lot of prairies, and there's other western puffballs that you'll see in the forest that are smaller, but they both have that kind of, you can see kind of like the little dots on the top, and they have that very fleshy center. Uh, so these bottom ones are a little tougher. Anybody know this bottom left? You might be able to guess its name by the what it looks like. It's called the woods ear. Yeah, and you'll see them a lot. In the, I see them a lot in the swan when decomposing logs. And this bottom right one is one of the most medicinal mushrooms in the entire world. Anybody know what that one is? Turkey tail. No, that's called the reishi. The reishi. Yeah, turkey tail is a little more like kind of brown and tan, and it grows in a similar pattern. I'm not sure. <coughs> So mushrooms are part of the fungi kingdom. Uh, they encompass a kingdom that's a lot more similar to humans than it is to plants. Uh, so some fungi, a very small percentage, produce a fruiting body, which is what we call mushrooms. Uh, obviously not all fungi do. So most mushrooms are predeterminate, which means that they have a gill and stems, and that's how they spread their spores, and that's what these top you know, two would be, even though you can't see the stem there, there is a stem to the puff ball, and this is a classic predeterminant. Whereas other ones are what we kind of just envelop what they're eating. So these two here are pretty much just growing around the organic matter that they're decomposing. So just to give a little bit of background on the mushroom life cycle, when you see a mushroom, that's essentially the, the beginning and the end stage of a mushroom life. So you have a mushroom that reaches full maturity, that mushroom uh, just disperses its spores from underneath its gills or whatever other mechanism it has. These spores germinate. You can think of this like being the seed of a mushroom. 
And then once these seeds germinate, or spores germinate, then they form hyphae, which are the beginnings of a mycelium mat, which is, you know, when you lift a piece of wood or something decaying off of a forest floor, you see these white threads that are kind of spreading. That's what mushroom mycelium and hyphae are. So once two hyphae meet, uh, that's essentially mushroom reproduction. And then eventually, uh, once it's kind of reached a point where you get the optimal conditions for a mushroom to form, then you'll get a, a knot. And then the primordia, which is the pin form of a mushroom, the baby form, and most of them go from this stage to that stage in a matter of about three to five days, and then they just decompose into nothing. So why are mushrooms important? This is why I'm giving this talk, and the question I get from my wife quite a bit as to why I'm obsessed about mushrooms and very passionate about mushrooms because not many people are and kind of get labeled a weirdo if you are. Um, but mushrooms are a very underutilized source of whole food nutrition. Uh, we'll go through some slides about the actual nutritional components of mushrooms, but in terms of whole food nu nutrition that doesn't need to be processed, it's, it's pretty hard to beat mushrooms. Um, one of the most potent medicinal foods um, and this next statement is from Paul Stamet's book, Mycelium Running, and it's Fungi are Nature's Internet. And what that means is that fungi are the interconnected web that basically mesh everything together from you know, a plant to the soil, from that soil to soil five miles away, from one ecosystem to another. It, it connects everything. There's mycelium running throughout everything that we step on, and we just don't know about it. And we're just learning now how important that fungal mass is to our soil. And again, fungi create soil, they're the great decomposers of the world. They take organic matter and turn it back into soil and um, sequester that carbon into the ground. Then the most exciting thing about mushrooms recently has been um, their use as medicine and um, in bioremediation, biopesticides, and biotechnology. So we'll start out talking about gourmet mushrooms. Uh, there's over 1.5 million species of fungi identified, and you know thousands every year that are being identified. Only a little over 10,000 of these produce mushrooms, so that's a pretty small percentage, which is why you know people don't always associate mushrooms with fungi, and why it's such a diverse and mysterious topic. Only about 300 of those 10,000 are considered choice edible, that's not saying that only 300 are actually edible, it's saying that there's you know, hundreds of others you could eat, they just are not worth eating. Um, and then less than 50 of these have been domesticated, um, meaning someone has produced them at some point and figured out a way to cultivate them. And then only about 15, and this would vary based off of what area of the world you're talking about, whether it's United States or worldwide, you know, obviously in Asia they produce way different mushrooms than we typically grow over here, but only 15 are produced commercially. So most common gourmet mushrooms. Um, so this picture right here is a white button, and then a cremini, and then a portobello. The most thing that people realize about this is this is the same mushroom. It's just at different growth stages of its life. So this is like two days setting pins and starting to grow. This is probably five days and this is about seven days. So it's just a larger form of the same mushroom. These three mushrooms make up 96% of the volume of mushrooms sold in the United States. And even more terrifying to that end is, so I grew up uh, not far from Kent Square, Pennsylvania, which is in Chester County, which that area accounts for 60 of the mushroom growth in the entire U.S. And the reason that is is that there's a lot of horse stables, a lot of you know, show horses and competition horses are kept there, and they, the way that these are grown are on composted horse manure, so there's a source there, so 60% of the mushrooms being produced in the United States come from basically like a five mile radius. So the remainder of gourmet mushrooms are classified as exotics, and so the second most produced is oyster, um, and that's still only at about one and a half percent of the total volume produced every year. Uh, next is shiitake, and then the remainder of exotic mushrooms that are produced make up less than 1% of the pounds produced per year. So some other exotics that you may or may not have seen in stores at some point, uh, that would include enoki, 
which is also another word for Namico. So there are two different forms, and we'll show some pictures of that later. Lion's mane, uh, paddy straw, which is a very common mushroom in, the, in China and Japan, and then maitake, it's also called chicken of the woods, or hen of the woods, sorry. And so some of the other common edibles that you would see in a culinary use um, would be morel, porcini, trumpet, or chanterelle, but these are all wild mushrooms. These are foraged, and these, you know, people have commercial picking permits that they then sell these to. These are basically varieties that are not economically viable to produce commercially. There's people that have found ways to do morel patches, um, but you get a lot more morels going out to a burn area, you know, the year after spending 15 minutes and the time and effort it takes to try to, there's so much work that goes into recreating the environment that that mushroom likes and it's just not worth doing that at all. So here are pictures of the ones that we just listed. Obviously we've already identified, so these are some of our yellow woosters that we had at the market last year. Um, so I named all those other ones on the slide before to see if you can match up. Which one's watching? watch? Anybody know that top middle? Lion. It's lion's mane. Top right. Yeah, so that's my talking. This, bottom right. This is patty straw. Uh, this is a, you, um, if anybody's eaten an alley connection, <laughs> they have them throughout a lot of their dishes. They're very strange looking in a dish where you don't know what it is. But these are very unique mushrooms because uh, in areas like India and Thailand, um, where it's very hot and humid, you can grow these mushrooms on straw in a period of about 10 days. They are super aggressive colonizers. All right, so we've narrowed down to these two. And again, this is an example of two forms of the same exact mushroom. This is Namico, this is Anoki. So Namico is uh, the base for miso broth. So if you've ever eaten some red miso broth, that's what this is used for. Enoki is, again, common in Asian cuisine. The way we get the enoki to grow like this, so the difference between that and that is this is kind of how it grows naturally in the environment, growing off of decaying wood or organic matter. This is grown in plastic bottles where the CO2 in the room is jacked up so high that the stems get very long and it gets discolored like this. So it's basically mutated to because people like the tender stems, it's kind of like a sprout or something like that. Okay, so how are these mushrooms produced? As I kind of mentioned already, the, all the agaricus varieties, which are the white button, the cremini, and the portabella, are all grown on usually horse manure compost. You can do on other varieties of compost. Um, so they're taking a waste product and turning it into food, but not, I don't want to try to discourage you from eating button and cremini and stuff like that, but. It is kind of the comparison of factory farming to, you know, intensive farming, where this is a giant, like, 5,000 square foot warehouse just stacked with all these vats of horse manure that's been, you know, slightly composted, and they're just pumping air. So it's very energy intensive, um, and they're just selling it in mass quantities. And, I mean, to me, there's much better varieties of mushrooms. I'd like to see all the other exotic mushrooms kind of start to overtake. White button, cremini, and portobello as the percentage grown that you can see. So the other exotics are grown in a lot of different ways. Um, most are grown on a woody substrate um, or agricultural waste. So shiitake and most other species other than oysters are grown usually on supplemented sawdust. So one of the most common ways is uh, producers, and this is what we do as well, is you take either sawdust from a local mill, and it has to be hardwood sawdust, or you take, a lot of people are using fuel pellet, which has already been compressed and somewhat sterilized, rehydrating that, and then adding a supplement, which is either wheat bran, um, soy hulls, anything that's basically a, a seed or cereal byproduct that has some nitrogen in it, and not a whole lot of other components that adds a lot of nutrition to the mushrooms and increases your yield. Um, shiitakes are also grown on logs. Um, it's not as common, obviously, out here because we don't have oak, which is the preferred species. We don't have a whole lot of hardwood in general. But oysters are the, the most exciting to me because they will grow on anything that has any amount of cellulose or linen in it whatsoever. Uh, 
you can grow oysters on jeans, you can grow oysters on phone books, on toilet paper, on card, I fruited oysters on cardboard. Um, they are one of the greatest decomposers that there are. Commercially, um, for the most part, people grow them on cereal straws, and then on, some people do them on the sawdust blocks as well. Um, people will do them on peanut shells, uh, corn cobs, anything that's basically an agricultural waste product. What is cereal straws? So wheat straw, barley straw, uh, oat straw, pea straw, anything that's a you know, cereal product that you take that straw component, which is the leftover part of the hay that's just the shaft and the, the non-nutritive part of the, the grass. And that's all that's left of that is basically cellulose. It's all just fiber, and the reason that's good for growing these things is it's, there's not a whole lot of nutrient in there for contamination to get into. And so if you give that mushroom mycelium a couple weeks time to really get in there and start to decompose that, you're not going to... The biggest thing with growing mushrooms commercially is dealing with contamination. Um, there's mold everywhere. There's fungi and bacteria and all the air. I mean, it's a terrifying thing to think of, but it's just floating around. And what we want to do is give the mushroom substrate a uh, leg up on, you know, the other competitor contaminants that are out there. Because if you leave anything with, you know, anything wet that has any nutritive value to it whatsoever, in two weeks it's going to have mold on it. And what we're trying to do is avoid that and get the mushroom to fully colonize it so that it'll fruit without issues. But it's, it's pretty amazing, and you guys may have seen the... The infographic that um, Free the Seeds has out now about kind of connecting the food economy and everything like that. And to me, that is the biggest way that mushrooms play a role and why we need more mushrooms um, and more mushroom farmers is they are great decomposers and you can grow all these things from basically what people are throwing away. Uh, I mean, a lot of places, here not as much, but straw is, is very cheap. Um, that's what we grow most of our oysters on is, is straw, we barley and wheat straw. And it's amazing. So there's a term in growing mushrooms called biological efficiency. And it's basically the weight of mushrooms you're getting from the dry weight of substrate that you're using. So if I use 40 pounds of dry straw, I'm getting 105% biological efficiency, which means I'm getting more than 40 pounds of mushrooms off of that straw. Uh, it's a pretty amazing thing when, so sometimes we'll grow them in uh, big Rubbermaid bins and you'll, you know, I'll be carrying like a 60 pound bin around and after two fruitings you've got to pick it up and you know, almost like lift it off the ground because there's no weight left. All that weight is left through the mushrooms. All and the so straw. All the straw is decomposed and then turned into mushrooms. Turns them into mushrooms. And there's still weight left in there because right. the mushrooms are also 60% water so they're absorbing all the moisture from the atmosphere which is why you get that high biological efficiency. I mean, that's how you can get over 100% weight off of that substrate weight is between the moisture and what it's actually extracting from the substrate. So, if you, if you buy your, your, um, your substrate, your straw or whatever, if, if you buy that organically if you, or if you buy it not organically, does that have an effect on your mushrooms being organic or not? So, it does on what you're selling. Um, but we'll get into bioremediation later about what mushrooms and oysters in particular have the capability to do. They can break down any toxic substance into less harmful substances and make it so that, you know, the, the worst thing that you can think of is basically edible after they're done decomposing it. Like so, horse manure. Well, even worse than horse manure, like petroleum, um, like PCBs, like herbicides, pesticides. Yeah, they can. And then those mushrooms are actually edible? They are. I mean, there's. I don't know that there's a lot of people that would go and eat them, but they've been. Yeah, they've run tests. Well, there's a couple of slides later on. We'll, we'll go to that in more detail when we get to the micro like, remediation and, wow. and how that's being used. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, when you're growing mushrooms and straw, mm -hmm. and you say that you know you have to be careful of mold and whatnot, mm -hmm. do you do something to the straw first to yeah. help with that. So we're so. treating. So straw is usually pasteurized meaning that we get it up to 170 degrees and we keep it there for about an hour. Um, on these other mushrooms like shiitake or anything that's grown on sawdust, supplemented sawdust in particular, 
uh, you're sterilizing that. So you're getting it above 200 and holding it there for hours to make sure that, because that, that supplemental material putting in there is just nitrogen rich and is a bacterial, you know, mecca. They're, they're going to love that and they're going to go crazy in there. So you can try, I mean, with I've done it before with sawdust, with the pellets, like I mentioned, people use fuel pellets. You can literally just dump boiling water into fuel pellets to rehydrate them and then try to grow mushrooms on that, but your yields are going to be super low because it's, there's no nutritive qual you know, quality of just sawdust. It's something that the mushroom needs to myceliate and get like, their, their roots growing, but to really fruit and be productive, it needs a supplemental material. And the straw has that because it has occasional seeds in there, and there's a little bit of residual quality to the grass that's in the straw that's giving it kind of a better yield than so the sawdust alone. Do you have a special setup to boil straw? Uh, we do a couple different ways. Um, so there's a basically a hot water immersion where you just kind of dunk it for an hour and keep it above 170. There's cold pasteurization, which you use a high pH environment, which you would use hydrate the mine. And so you're just getting up to a pH above 10, and that's going to kill off the really harmful microbes that are going to outcompete the fungi. But oyster mycelium is so aggressive that it can, as long as you give it that you know, 10 day to 14 day head start. Even if mo I've had ones that start to get contaminated by mold and a day later it'll just eat it and just devour it. They are super aggressive. So um, like if you used coffee, coffee grounds, you would? They're very rich in nitrogen, so that's very easily contaminated. Yeah. So, yeah. so they're used coffee, coffee grounds. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to boil them again. Well, but they're very rich in nitrogen. Uh -huh. So there is a good chance that unless you're using them like right out of your, so if you're going to do like coffee grounds and you just want to you know make a little batch at home and something, at the second you get them out of the hot water, dump them into something and put mycelium in there with them, spawn, and make sure they're not exposed to anything. Because I, I used to do that where I used to try to collect the coffee grounds from Starbucks where they will occasionally give them away and I would bring two five gallon buckets home. And then they started getting not so good with doing it fresh, and they would save it for like two days for me. And so I would get it, and it would already start to have some signs of mold on it. Mm -hmm. And then I would go and you know try to grow mushrooms on it, and it would just get contaminated. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing: is mushroom or coffee grounds is still very high in nitrogen. If we're talking about like a brown versus a green when you talk about compost, and it's a very high green. So you you want to use things that are more on the line of just like a woody material, something that's very high carbon and not and low in nitrogen. So your carbon to nitrogen ratio is very high and that's the best for low contamination. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the nutritional qualities of mushrooms. Um, surprisingly high in protein and fiber and low in fat and simple carbohydrates. Um, most edible mushrooms are between 32 and 40% protein by dry weight. Um, so if we're going to compare 200 grams of mushrooms contains about 30 grams of protein and that's compared to the same serving as about 52 grams of beef, 48 chicken, 26 in eggs, and 42 in beans. So it's more protein than eggs. Um, they are also rich in beta-glucans, uh, progesterols, B vitamins, and linoleic acid, which is omega-6. Um, Good source of selenium, copper, zinc, and potassium, which are some of the most vital vitamins for immune control. Um, you know, if you take something that's supposed to be like a immunity boost or anything like that, those are the four of the vitamins that you really want the highest quantity of. And uniquely, it is the only non-animal source of vitamin D. So the ergosterol is a sterile; it's an alcohol that exists in mushrooms that. When the mushrooms are exposed to ultraviolet light, it creates vitamin D2. And the more you expose it to sunlight, it creates more D2 to the point where it's above the IUs of what you take out of the supplement. So if, you know, especially this time of year, you know, low light days and getting that cabin fever, starting to feel a little flu coming on, mushrooms are a great kind of cure-all. We typically try to expose our mushrooms to some kind of uh, daylight just so that and it doesn't take much to get that vitamin D content in it because it is dependent upon having UV exposure. So if somebody grows their 
mushrooms completely indoors and doesn't have any exposure to outside light, then it doesn't have as high a quantity of, of vitamin D in it. So just some notes on cooking mushrooms, and it sounds like a, a few people are familiar with oysters, but um, what I typically do with the oysters is just kind of rip the gills apart and just kind of saute them in, in some butter, olive oil, coconut oil, whatever your preferred cooking uh, fat is. Um, yellow oysters have a strange cashew nutty flavor that's very unique. Uh, pink oysters uh, basically taste like shrimp. And especially the younger they are, the more seafood kind of flavor they have to them. It's very unique. And that's why I think mushrooms are great for an area like this because we are landlocked. We have no availability of seafood. Uh, and it's you know, not that economically viable to ship in seafood every day. And so elm oysters are sweeter and they kind of taste a little bit like anise. And it's, it's a very unique thing. When, when we're growing oyster mushrooms, I know when things are going well because you'll step into the grow room and it just smells like anise cookies. It's got this crazy sweet aroma that I've, I've kind of triggers things in me now that I've been used to doing this for a couple of years. Um, so king oysters are kind of unique. So on those other varieties of oysters, and all except king, the stem is not particularly edible. It's not poisonous, it's not bad for you, but it might give you some intestinal issues if you try to eat the stem. So you should usually cut it just below the stem. Um, but king oysters have this kind of tuber-like stem here. And if you slice this into, you know, about half inch to inch thick sections of the stem, there's no way you can tell the difference between that and scallops if you just cook it in butter. It's, it's kind of creepy how close the scallops it is. So all these are high in protein. Consistency and taste. Consistency and taste. Absolutely astound. Like, you could probably, with people that aren't like a complete refined palate, you could, nine out of ten times, they would not um, all these are high in protein and they can be used. So the stems, if you don't eat them, you can use them. You can ground them up into a fine powder and use them as a thickener. Um, because of the protein content and the makeup of the mushroom, it can also be used as a flour. So you can use it in anything you use a flour for, including making bread. There are people that make mushroom bread uh, that have you know gluten issue. And I didn't want to go through every type of mushroom, but. This is probably one of the mushrooms that people have the most trouble with because it's so fleshy. You know, just this type of mushroom, and it just seems kind of strange to, to deal with. But these should be cooked based off of the maturity. Um, so like that top one, is a, it's a very large giant puffball. Not very large, but it's you know kind of getting past its prime, so it's going to be a little firmer. But the, good, the thing with these fleshy mushrooms is you want to get them when they're younger and less mature because then they're kind of flakier and they almost exhibit like a crab-like flavor and texture where the meat kind of just like pulls apart. The older ones are you know, kind of like a potato, they're a little starchier or like a really hard cheese. Um, so this is the way you would prepare like a giant puff ball. You can either dice it up like that and a lot of people will marinate it and treat it like either tofu or if you put it in uh, you know, thicker slabs you can marinate it like you would mozzarella and then just kind of lightly saute it and then eat it. Um, or you can kind of make it into steaks and then like treat it like a patty. Um, but this this cooking method and the way you treat this is good for puffballs, lime bean, larger wine cap that we talked about the first slide, maitake, and porcini. So this is a porcini right here, which is also called king sap or king bullet. Um, it's one of the most common uh, gourmets in French cuisine. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the health qualities of mushrooms. So, pretty much all gourmet mushrooms are medicinal mushrooms, in the sense that they all have some medicinal quality, some benefit to them. It's not the reverse, where not all, you know, medicinal mushrooms are gourmet because not all of them are edible. But mushrooms have a huge spectrum of health benefits in terms of, you know, if we're talking about just being healthy to eat as a comparative option to something less healthy, uh, to helping in everyday health and immune support, to battling illness, you know, whether it's a common cold or a chronic sickness that you have, and then even to battling deadly diseases like cancer. So there's a lot of research, and unfortunately the research has only been done on button mushrooms right now, but Penn State has conducted a lot of research on the button and carini mushrooms that show that 
they are amazing at regulating healthy blood glucose and good for treating the beginning stages of uh, you know, metabolic syndrome and diabetes. Diet rich in mushrooms is going to reduce your unhealthy cholesterol just naturally because of the beta glucans that are in there. They're, there's really dense fibers that help with your blood cholesterol. And then many mushrooms have qualities that are antimicrobial, antioxidant, and help with overall, or overall immune support. And so this infographic here is from, uh, there's a lot of places that produce mushrooms commercially that also, yes? Um, do these qualities go away after they're cooked? Does that affect them at all? Or? Not necessarily. Um, so if you're really looking for medicinal qualities of mushrooms and you want something for like more than just like healthy eating, there's uh, supplements that you can take as well. And so this infographic here is from, this is actually a supplement that I take, um, Paul Stamets, who's one of the most famous mycologists in the world, uh, has a line of products called Host Defense, and it ranges from just everyday health to like brain and around support through lines and stuff like that. And there's a couple other companies out there, and I'll mention them. There's a slide at the end that has some resources for places to buy certain things. Um, but this is just uh, one example of a blend of mushrooms that you could take via a supplement. And this one in particular contains cordyceps and reishi, which are the two most medicinal mushrooms that there are. The reishi mushroom, which I showed in the first slide, is been used for over a thousand years in China and they call it the mushroom of immortality because it has so many qualities. So this just lists the qualities of cordyceps and reishi, so that's antimicrobial. So if you're taking it and you have something that you have an unhealthy gut or something, you're trying to battle in your immune system, that'll help with that. Um, antioxidant, uh, blood pressure support, uh, blood sugar support, um, so immune enhancer, Kidney tonic, liver tonic, respiratory support, cardiac support. Yeah. I just hear something. The that blend actually has got rid of all my son's asthma symptoms in the past three months. Whereas this time last year and the year before he was on steroids and in the ER. Mm -hmm. But so he had a cold and no asthma symptoms. So it's cold, I mean it's yeah. Awesome. yeah it is. I'm not gonna sell to you like it's snake oil. But, I mean, they're organic things that are tested. There's medical evidence of, you know, all the immune benefits to the, these products. And I'm not going to, you know, try to sell you on any of them. I don't have any association with any of these products. There's tons of them out there. And if you go to, like, Withy's or Natural Grocers, I don't know if Mountain Valley carries any. Um, but they all have these in the sections where they have, like, the herbal supplements and things like that. And you can find them. You can buy them online as well. Basically, any medicinal quality that could be available through a food is available for those first two. And then if we get to lion's mane, uh, it has been discovered to have amazing neuroregenerative qualities where it's now being used to treat you know, beginning stages of dementia, Alzheimer's, um, people with neuropathy. Uh, it has neuroregenerative qualities where it can recreate neural connections in your brain and in your nerve system. And it's, there are compounds that are unique to this mushroom. The name is Hericium, uh, it doesn't have it here, but the compound is Hericium, and it's named after this mushroom, and it's you know, one of the only sources in the world of this compound that has this neuroregenerative quality to it. And so there's maitake that has healthy blood sugar, and you know, over here is just basically some what other herbal supplements or things that you would take that would be similar to it. Uh, chaga has, that's another thing that's kind of like a, a snake oil and an Asian uh, medicine where they think it kind of just cures everything. And so there's people going around harvesting chaga all over throughout the birch forests throughout the world to get these things because it demands such high price. But if you're going to look at, you know, one of the most common gourmet mushrooms that has the best qualities, that would be the shiitake mushroom. That has anti-tumor qualities, it has blood sugar, cardiac support, blood pressure, about half of the benefits that the cordyceps and reishi do. But that's one that you can eat and still get, and it doesn't lose most of the qualities through cooking. So 
what they do with a lot of these supplements now is you don't need to actually eat the mushroom to get the quality, the medicinal quality. So what they do is they create extracts from the mycelium. And that's just a more sustainable way of, of making this medicine. So they don't have to, you know, because things like reishi and uh, chaga only happen in usually old growth forest. So we don't want to be going old growth forest and tearing all these mushrooms down and destroying future mushrooms. So if we can find ways to create the mycelium in labs, that's a much more environmentally conscious way to produce this medicine and not have to harm the, the ecosystem that you know, these mushrooms are a part of. This is a summary, and like I said, it's not just the medicine to make you feel better. It literally will do <coughs> certain forms of cancer. And this, this is all medically documented. Um, 14 different varieties of mushrooms have anti-cancer properties. Uh, the benefits of this range from just immune support and first line defense to actual anti-tumor properties to you know, help with recovering from the treatment process of chemotherapy and radiation which is, you know, just wreaks havoc on your immune system. Uh, so the reishi mushroom has been documented to increase the activity of your natural killer cells in defense of five types of cancer. So your natural killer cells are when you have malignant tumors. That's what gets turned off in your system. That, that's why they keep growing or stay the same as you're basically your body's not processing and breaking down those cells. But this will increase the activity naturally of those cells and reduce tumor size. So maitake blocks tumor growth and kills malignant cells. And then turkey tail is probably the most studied. Um, there's a National Institute of Health study that's been going on since 2012 that has shown complete recovery in association with other treatments of breast cancer and sarcoma. Um, Paul Stamets, again, had uh, collaborated on, um, it was University of Washington Hospital that did a breast cancer trial and they just saw, I think it was 80% recovery rates in people that were already stage four that would have typically had you know, survival rates of 10 to 20% with this addition of rate or turkey tail. And in addition to that, there's a patent medicine called PSK that is developed from turkey tail, which has been around for about 20 years. And they are now using that to prevent oncoviruses, um, such as HPV, which are viruses that you get and then lead to future cancer. Um, if someone was wanting to eat turkey tail, would it be an extract? Yeah, you could get it in a liquid form or a pill um, that was a mycelial extract. Um, there's sprays. Um, but that's something, I mean, I know at least five people, I mean, everybody knows someone that has cancer or has had cancer in their family. And I have multiple people that I know that have been given this by a homeopath in conjunction with the treatment and, and almost always has positive results and so it's something that's becoming more common and I my father had stage 4 cancer and I tried desperately to get him to look into mushroom supplements but like a lot of people he's a microphobe and thought I was a witch doctor trying to you know sell him on some crazy treatment and like avoid western medicine and I said no this is you know, most, a lot of doctors will prescribe this now as a supplement to what you're doing. It's not, no one's saying that this will cure cancer by itself. This is meant to be a supplemental treatment along with whatever your doctor is prescribing. All these things you can buy uh, at a health food store. I mean, the, the dosage that they would probably give you for, you know, cancer treatment is probably a lot higher than what you would get buying it as like immune support, so you might be better off getting it through a doctor at that point. But if you just want, as a preventative measure, just buy it at a natural grocer or you know another local health food store, and you know just try to. I take uh, and I mean, it's probably been two years since I've even had a cold or anything like that. After 9/11, the Department of Defense had a program called the, the BioShield program that did a study of different supplements that they were trying to develop medicines for treatments of um, viruses and diseases that could be weaponized, you know, from terrorist attacks. And through that program, uh, extracts from the agaricon, uh, the amadou, and a couple other polypore mushrooms showed very highly potent defense against hepatitis B, herpes simplex 1 and 2, HIV, influenza, smallpox, anthrax, and tobacco mosaic virus, which is disease but they did this wide stretching study to see 
what they could get mushrooms to treat, and they came up with all these medicines in very small quantities and very small you know parts per million that basically treated influenza and smallpox and anthrax in particular better than any medicine that was on the market at the time. So one of the ways that mushrooms do this is they produce secondary metabolites. So when you have a mass of mycelium that has already colonized a, a substrate um, and you introduce an outside attack to the mycelium, it will produce these metabolites because the way that mushrooms eat is they basically are, their entire mass is their stomach and they're absorbing nutrients and liquid and other materials through basically the pores in their mycelium. So when you introduce, you know, something, whether it's a disease, whether it's E. coli, whether it's, you know, carcinogen or something like that, onto the mushroom mycelium, it will start to produce these secondary metabolites, which are basically the mushroom's defense and how it eats and devours and decomposes that compound. And so one of the most exciting things that has happened lately is that through this use of this technology of secondary metabolites, they are now developing basically treatments for drug-resistant bacteria using my mushrooms. Or say you go to a hospital and you get a strain of streptococcus that is not responding to you know, normal bacteria or you're allergic to a certain kind of antibiotic or something like that. They can go into a lab with a mushroom mycelium take the strain and sample of your disease, put it into that my mycelium, take the extract of the metabolite that develops as a response, the mushroom is developing a response to that outside attack. Take the medicine that it forms, give that to you, and that treats your disease. It's something that's in the very beginning stages and it's very exciting and people are working on patents for it and it's probably gonna be a long time before we see anything like that. And there's still questions of whether or not that's viable to do on like an individual scale, but for these super viruses and you know super bacterial infections that we're seeing sweep through hospitals, it seems like kind of our only line of defense right now. And so most of these medicines, like I said, are you know they're derived from polypores that exist in the old growth forest. You know, Garicon, the one listed up there that had the defense against all of these violent diseases, only exists in you know basically the Pacific Northwest old growth forest. So this is another reason why a lot of my colleagues are saying, you know, the health benefits and the medicinal benefits of mushrooms is reason enough to protect our old growth forest and, you know, to develop our forestry programs around keeping this resource. And this is a resource bank that we have that's free that we need to be responsible about maintaining. So my ceiling is nature's internet. As we kind of discussed, this is how everything's connected. And it's really hard to imagine this, but in one cubic inch of soil, which is about this big, there gonna be eight miles of mycelium. And that's through all these little hyphae and strands. This is a mycorrhizal mass that is formed under the sea. Um, so the mycelium act as an intermediary. Um, they're gonna help the plant roots by absorbing nutrients, moisture, minerals. Um, they're gonna send messages to plants that are in distress to say, all right, you need to, you need this mineral to fight this attack, or you have insects feeding on your leaves right now. You need to do something about it. So they form these networks that help plants communicate with each other, and to form the response that they need to protect themselves. And it's, I mean, it's essentially the the difference between healthy and unhealthy soil is is mycelium and fungi. So when we talk about fungi in general, they can be Saprophytic, which is basically their primary decomposer of organic matter. So these are the types of mushrooms that just eat dead wood and turn it back into soil. They can be endophytic, which is when they exist in the cells of plants. They can be parasitic, meaning that they're killing live trees, plants, shrubs, and then decomposing them, or setting the stage for another decomposer to come in. Or they can be mycorrhizal, which is like the picture we just showed, where they exist in the soil, and, and they help form these beneficial relationships between plants. So saprophytes are the, you know, the decomposers. So these are like your oyster mushrooms, your shiitake mushrooms. They don't ever attack healthy living plants. They attack already decomposing or injured plants, and they just take over and say, all right, it's your time to go back into soil. We'll do that for you. 
So parasitic mushrooms were usually considered as hostile, but you know the more we kind of learn about it, it kind of seems like there's there's a reason to their madness. Like this here is a 2,400 acre mass of mycelium in Oregon that's over 2,200 years old that is basically one giant mat of honey mushrooms, and that mat of honey mushrooms has taken this from dense forest like it's here into prairie over millennia or you know a couple hundred years but they're basically meadow makers so they're changing ecosystems when there's a signal that there needs to be pasture instead of forest then this mushroom moves in and changes that for them and this is just a diagram of what a mycorrhizal network looks like so this is a comparison and you can see in these pictures this is with mycorrhizae without this is without mycorrhizae, this is with, and this is the diagram. So all these little strands are the, the hyphae, and these are tubers called sclerotia that form in these mats that connect everything. So um, that is another form of mycorrhizal mushrooms that form as underground ones. Um, truffles are actually a mushroom, and truffles are actually the product of forming these nodules. In a mycorrhizal network. One of the more exciting things that's happened in the last 10 to 15 years is the development of <coughs> mycopesticides. So some of you may have seen this on the Planet Earth special where they had the, the zombie ants that were taking this mycelium back and then they would go to this high point and then a mushroom would form out of their head and it would disperse the spores and that would just colonize you know a bunch of other so we've learned through nature that we can use a lot of these fungi, which are called entomopathogenic fungi, to parasitize or kill a lot of harmful insects. So cordyceps, which is one of the ones that we talked about for medicinal purposes, which was you know, a super mushroom for medicinal purposes, is also extremely useful as a mycopesticide. So this is a cordyceps sinensis mushroom growing out of a carpenter ant. And so there's already patents on a mycopesticide for carpenter ants. That was Paul Stamets, again, who developed. He basically had an infestation of carpenter ants in his house in Washington and tried a bunch of different mycelium and realized that they really loved the, the taste of one particular kind of mycelium, and so they would take chunks of it back to their, their nest, and then that would infect the rest of the nest. So not only does it kill them, within like two to three days, but it also makes them bring it back to the colony and then infect the rest of the colony and get rid of your problem you know, within a week. But something else, um, they've been using cordyceps and there's about five other varieties of mushrooms that they've been trying to use the spores of to treat mosquitoes, which, I mean, people have been trying to come up with a, a cure for mosquitoes in you know, very tropical areas for, for decades to reduce malaria and other mosquito-borne diseases. And, they're starting to develop, to develop really good results. The method is just, so how this works is the spores need to come in contact with the insect body. And once it does, basically these spores use the insect's body as a food source. So it's eating the insect. So at some point it gets to where it's mostly mushroom and no longer insect. And that's when the insect either dies or turns into a mushroom. Um, so one other, and this is a non-mushroom fungi, but I thought it was worth mentioning, is Puveria bassiana. Um, so it's marketed here as botanigori. And so we started using this last year. And the only issue with this is it's a broad spectrum. So this is a fungi that exists in healthy soil and natural environments. It's already there. It's not something that's toxic. But when you apply it, it is a broad spectrum insect killing, but it treats, if you look at the, the species that it treats, if you're a grower, pretty much anything that could potentially be the bane of your, your growing existence, aphids, white flies, um, you know, cabbage beetles, uh, flea beetles, anything that you could potentially have issues with, this will kill if it comes in contact with it. That's the risk though, is it, it is a broad spectrum pesticide so that if you're just spraying it and you know there's a puddle of it and a bee comes in contact, that it's not known yet whether or not that will affect the bee. So Nicole Masters, who was here in November and did a soil conference that I went to, uh, she's developed a method for injecting this into the seed bed when you're planting plants and creating the mycorrhizal network that way. 
so that any insect that goes to feed on the root system or the plant tissue beneath the soil surface will immediately be killed. And this is a completely safe, otherwise, as long as it's not you know, out somewhere where other insects can be in contact with it, there is no harm to the environment or anybody else. Another exciting uh, development is treatment um, for colony collapse disorder. About a decade ago, you know, a lot of bee growers were experiencing upwards of 60% loss in their hives, and it's kind of tapered down to about 30% today. But honeybees suffer from several viruses, including deformed wing virus and Lake Sinai virus. Um, they're also terrorized by varroa mites, which basically it's, it's hard to tell whether or not the, the virus causes the mites or the mites cause the virus, but it's become accepted that these are the common the sources of colony collapse disorder. So recent studies um, from extracts of Reishi and Amadou have shown 79-fold reduction in deformed wing virus and 45,000-fold reduction in Lake Sinai virus. And there's another insecticide that is this Metarhizum anisophily. Uh, mushroom has been shown to parasitize the Varroa mites, meaning it does the same thing that the other um, Bugeri bassiana and the, um, the other like the pesticides do to insects where it just kills that off, but it does not harm the bees. So this is a technology that's being developed right now that potentially help cure a colony collapse disorder. So mycofiltration, um, basically mycelium are already the liver and the detoxifying component of the environment. So people have started to use that um, to our advantage and develop ways to filter harmful things like pesticides, uh, and high nitrates, um, other contaminants out of waterways. And we do this by creating basically, um, you know, basically a blockade of myceliated. So what's in these is basically their wood chips or straw. It's been myceliated with oyster mushroom. And they're creating a barrier that this will filter through. And essentially all, you know, there's been four or five studies through departments of transportation that have shown that this is good at, you know, upwards of 90% reductions in E. coli from uh, contamination for pesticides, herbicides, uh, high nitrate environments, that they're getting more than acceptable levels of water purity from just applying this simple technology that costs maybe $100. So oyster and wine cap are the two that are the most productive in this uh, technology. So microremediation, we started talking before about you know the types of toxins. This picture right here is a couple cubic yards of petroleum contaminated soil that was then colonized with oyster mycelium, and then these are all oyster mushrooms growing out. And so what they did, this was a Washington DOT um, study that they did where they had a contamination site, and they wanted to test to see if they could take the soil, remediate it to a point that they could then reuse it for fill in roadway surfaces. And so they were expecting to still have some level of contamination. They basically removed 95% of all soil contaminants, and then they further tested the mushrooms and there was no evidence of polyaromatic hydrocarbons or petroleum or anything in the mushrooms. And this is what they do, and we're still kind of figuring out how it happens, but they basically break it down into much less harmful compounds, and then again into much, they're basically making it into simpler molecules that are not harmful anymore. And the process here is the same. You can do this in situ where you're kind of placing the mycelium in a, a soil that is highly contaminated, or a lot of times they will have to remove the soil, put it in a pile, treat it, and a lot of times they are just getting rid of the mushrooms because who's, how are you going to market, you know, like a remediation mushrooms for $2 a pound or something like that. Um, but there's still a list, you know, a laundry list that they're figuring out that they can use. I mean, someone recently figured out, they took a, I forget how large it contained, I think it was a 55 gallon drum of cigarette butts and myceliated it and then went back and tested it and there was no carcinogens detectable in after three months. We'll just go over a couple of quick ways that you can incorporate mushrooms into the, uh, the garden. So some mushrooms like uh, wine cap, almond agaricus and uh, elm oyster you can actually put into your garden beds and they do form uh, mutually beneficial relationships with plants. Some 
some not so much, so they're not really worth putting in there and kind of taking up nutrients. But another thing you can do is create a wood chip or debris patch. Um, and so a good place to do this is around like fruit trees or something like that because wine cap in particular will form mutually beneficial relationships with the roots of the trees or shrubs or whatever you put this next to because it is a my mycorrhizal mushroom. It will form relationships that will help your tree or whatever you plant it next to. So what you would want to do is find an area in either a 4x4 four four or a 4x8 area and you're going to want to scrape as much of the topsoil away as possible because that's going to have microbes that are going to compete with the uh, mushroom mycelium. And then, I'll go to the next slide here, but just if anyone wants to do this, about a five pound bag will cover about 30 square feet. And then here's the general process is you're gonna start, like I said, with pretty much bare soil. You're gonna put some cardboard down to create a barrier between the, net, the native soil. Then you're just gonna start lay, layering stacks of, you can do it with wood chips, you can do it with straw, you can do it with leaf litter. And then you're gonna put layers of, my, of grain spawn or sawdust spawn probably preferably in between, and then cover it with something that's going to keep the sun off of it and water it regularly for the first you know, month or so. And about three to four months, as long as everything stays moist in there and nothing gets in there and digs around, you'll have a patch of wine cap or oyster mushrooms um, kind of popping up like that. Do your layers need to be sterile or it's okay? No. Nope. Strafari is aggressive enough that it will not care as long as you're not using like moldy material stuff that's already moldy. Like you don't want to use old hay or something. The next year we have to do the same process. So it that? it'll kind of peter out towards like nine months. So like if you did it right now, you'd get a good fruiting probably in the summer and fall, and then it would go dormant and get another one in the spring. If you want to keep it going, just keep adding organic matter to it and keep feeding. So the common uh, log cultivation methods are shown here, you're going to want to use um, hardwood logs. We'll try to wrap up quick here in this time. But uh, four to six inch diameter, the ideal time to cut the logs for cultivation is late fall into winter. When they have a good amount of sap in there, they have a little more nutrition. And you're not going to get any competitor things moving in at that time either. Cut from live? Ideally, you want live and you want to do it within three to four weeks of live. It doesn't matter that it's green, that moisture in there is helping it. Mycelia. So the most common method is to just drill holes in like a pattern that's shown here like six inches apart and you can do that with just like a hand drill. They sell tools that you can attach to an angle grinder or they even have like, if you want to do this on scale, they sell actual tools meant for drilling the holes into these. Um, but you can also do it in a totem style where you just take like you know, six inch or 12 inch depths and then layer the spawn in between these. So here's what you do with the, uh, the plugs is so you buy these plug spawn, which are already myceliated with mushroom mycelium, and all those holes, you'll jam these in with a mallet, and then you'll cover up that outside with uh, beeswax. And that's gonna keep it moist inside, and about two months later, you'll see the mycelium moving through the mass into the heartwood and then into the center. So there's a couple other ways you can do it, too, is you can do, if you don't wanna drill, you can do divots and then just pack sawdust into there but same thing, you'll want to cover it up and prevent moisture loss. And if you have this, you'll, you'll want to spray, keep it in a shaded area, keep it moist around there um, so that they don't dry out. That's the, you know, the bane of mushrooms is being in a dry environment. And then six to nine months later, you have that. If you're using like four to six inch diameter logs, you'll get growth out of them for two to three years. Um, this is something I don't know if anybody's interested in, but if you're trying to grow my like a rizal fungi in a patch in your backyard, what you can do is you can take the stem butts, or you can even use spawn if you just find spawn somewhere that somebody has like some leftover spawns from that. Roll it up in some cardboard, put it in a Ziploc bag, it's damp, and put it in your refrigerator, and like six weeks later, you'll go in there and it's just a white mass. So now you have free spawn that you can spread throughout your, um, your garden. So here's some additional resources anybody wants to copy down. So these are sources of spawn if anybody's looking to do any kind of projects. And then these are some books that I would recommend if you want to learn some more than uh, that's the National Mycological Society. Thank you everybody for, uh, for joining me. I'm glad to see such a big turnout for mushrooms and I hope uh, 
see some of you guys. We have a booth downstairs, and hope to see you guys uh, market or, uh, somewhere else. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.